if we remember back to our very simple model of our communication system, we have uh, one endpoint a transmitting device, the other endpoint a receiving device, and they're, and they're connected via some link. And we said we can classify uh, or some link or some medium. And we can classify the different media as either guided or unguided. Guided, think as, as cables, and unguided being wireless communications. No, no cables, no wires. What this topic is about is giving some examples of different common transmission media. The, the things that form our links, that connect our transmitter to receiver. And we'll go through both wired and wireless, or guided and unguided media. <coughs> Before we, so we'll go through guided, wired media today, give a few examples. We'll start on wireless transmission principles today and then tomorrow finish with some examples on wireless communication systems, satellite, mobile phone and so on. Just very simple concepts. Uh, but before we go through them, we'll talk about some general factors that is relevant for both wired and wireless, guided or unguided. What are some of the factors that uh, we need to consider when we're, we're choosing a technology to connect our computers together? So we want to create a link from A to B. What technology do we use to connect A to B? Well, there are different factors that will impact on our choice. Some key ones are what data rate can be provided and across what distance. So the data rate is how fast we can send our data, say in bits per second. Depending upon the user's requirements, we may require a particular data rate. For example, if I want to transfer uh, a large amount of data between two computers over a short period of time, like uh, hundreds of DVDs burnt to a, a hard drive, I want to transfer them across a network. Uh, I, need, I would like to have a high data rate across that link or across that network so that I don't have to wait for days for that download or data transfer to complete. So a high data rate is common, commonly desired so that the user doesn't have to wait long, that we can uh, transfer our data as fast as possible. So generally we'd like to maximise or choose a technology that maximises the data rate. A high data rate is desirable. Another key factor is the distance that our technology can cover. Different technologies, both wired and wireless, are designed to work over different distances. So depending on what we want to connect. So one example is we want to connect this campus with the Rungsit campus. It's a distance of about 12 kilometres. 12 to 15 kilometres let's say 12 kilometres. We've got buildings at both campuses. And we want to choose a technology to connect them because we want to transfer our data between uh, the two SIT campuses. So we need a technology that can cover that distance or we need to use a technology that we can uh, may not cover that distance but we can uh, we'll see use multiple um, multiple links if we have a technology that has a maximum distance of one kilometer That is, there's some technology where the maximum distance of a single run of the cable is one kilometre. So, if you, with that technology you cannot transmit signals larger or further than one kilometre in distance. How do we use that to cover or connect our two campuses together? What can we do? So I tell you, here's a technology you can buy the, the cabling system, or the cables, uh, the transmitter and receiver, but it only covers one kilometre. What do we do to cover our campuses? Okay, so 
some sort of hub or some sort of intermediate device. We have our cable that goes from bunker D, goes for one kilometre, and then we have some intermediate device that we connect it to, into that receives the data, and then a second cable, and that intermediate device transmits the signal across the second link, and so on, until we get into the Rungsit campus. Because if it, our technology has a limit on the distance of, say, one kilometre, we, to cover this 12 kilometres, we need to have multiple runs or multiple links in this case. And there are different devices we can connect together, but in simple terms, it's uh, an amplifier or repeater. We send the signal across one kilometre and then a special device amplifies or repeats that signal across the next one kilometre until we get the, to the destination. Second technology, let's say it covers a distance of... So, another technology that covers a distance of 40 kilometres. Then in that case, it's obvious that we can run a single link between our two campuses. So we can connect our two campuses using both technologies, but the problem with the one with a shorter distance is that we need these extra devices in between our two campuses, which in, incur an extra cost, an extra complexity of building the network and, and managing the, the network. So we'd like a technology that covers as long a distance as possible to meet our requirements. So normally, when we're choosing a, a technology for connecting transmitter to a receiver, we care about data rate, distance, and maximising them. But of course, there are other factors as well. Cost is another main thing. Choose one which gives us the highest data rate, the appropriate distance, but is the cheapest. We'll see some different, really, uh, media and compare them from these perspectives. How do we get a high data rate? And how do we get to transmit across a long distance? Well, there are different factors that impact upon the data rate and the distance that we can send a signal. We've seen when we looked at signals, the bandwidth of the signal that we send impacts upon the data rate. Generally, when all things are the same, the higher the bandwidth, the higher the data rate. So we would like a technology that supports a high bandwidth so we can achieve a high data rate. What impacts upon the distance that which, which we can send? When I talk to you, if I didn't have the microphone on, can you, you can hear me if, if you're up close at the front, if you were sitting or if you're standing outside in the corridor, if I didn't have the microphone on, would you hear me? If I was talking normal strength? Yes, would you hear me or not? No, unlikely you'll hear me if I'm talking and you're out in the corridor. Why not? What, what's the, the term or, or what, why is that the case? Why can't you hear me if you're standing out in the corridor? Interference may be one thing. Out in the corridor and in here, there may be other people talking and transmitting, which makes it hard for you to hear. What else? Why can you hear me sitting here, but it's harder to hear me 5, 10, 20 metres away? What's the term that we use? It, it depends upon the distance. Our signal gets weaker across distance. Attenuation is, is the term that we've seen in the previous topic. Our signal attenuates. There's not, nothing we can do about that. When I transmit a signal, it starts at some strength, some power level. Across distance, it gets weaker and weaker and weaker. Okay? So, attenuation the signal getting weaker, is a transmission impairment. It impairs our transmission. 
Other impairments include interference. We tried to do a demo last week where if I talk and then more people start talking, it will be harder for one person to hear what I'm saying because there's more interference from other transmitters. So if I'm sending a signal from A to B, and then others start transmitting signals in the vicinity of B, then they can cause interference at B and make it difficult for the receiver at B to receive the information. So interference is a problem. Transmission impairments including attenuation, noise, uh, and some other factors. In some cases, the number of receivers in, in communication systems has an impact. The more receivers, uh, the weaker the signal is on the communications uh, at, at the next receiver. So we need to choose a technology that uh, gives us a high data rate and high distance or long distance and some of the imp factors that impact include the bandwidth of the signals, transmission impairments, interference. Uh, before we look at some more examples of transmission media, we've gone through examples before about AM and FM radio. Someone remind me of their favourite FM radio channel. An FM radio channel. Anyone? 93. 93 megahertz. Okay, it's usually 93 point something, but let's say... Uh, 93 point something megahertz. An example of an FM radio channel. Now, with all our communication systems, we don't send a signal at just one frequency. We send a signal at a range of frequencies. Remember, our signals are made up of, we can consider as made up of multiple components, each with individual frequencies. So when we say that this FM radio channel has a frequency of 93 megahertz, what does that really mean? Uh, if we try and plot in the frequency domain, so this is the signal peak amplitude as a function of frequency, then the typical shape or way to represent it We've seen, seen plots, and don't draw this, like this. Okay, very simplistic plots of signals with three components. Most real signals have a range of frequency components, and we'll see in practice the plots look more like this. Where this is showing that this signal contains frequency components from this frequency, let's say FL for the lower frequency to FH for the highest frequency. That's an F. So this signal contains frequency <coughs> components from here up until here. And the bandwidth as we've seen in all our uh, signal analysis, is just the, the highest component, FH, minus the lowest component. So you can think of this as containing impulses all in this area. Instead of drawing the individual impulses, we draw it as a curve here. So practical signals usually contain a range of frequencies, not just one frequency, and uh, cover some bandwidth. Now, coming back to our FM radio channel, 93 megahertz. What does that mean? That's usually used to refer to the center point in this range of frequencies. I've denoted as FC, the center frequency. So in this example, the center frequency is, say, 93 megahertz, point oh, oh, oh. We'll see why. Right. 
And this radio channel covers a range of frequencies centered at 93 megahertz. What's the bandwidth of FM radio? Well, as an example, the bandwidth is, say, 20 kilohertz. So the low frequency, FL, so you can think at, centered around 93 megahertz, 10 kilohertz to one side and 10 kilohertz to the other side. So FL being, what is it, 93, 92, point oh nine and FH the high frequency ninety three point oh one megahertz. How do we get those numbers? I said the bandwidth of our FM radio channel is 20 kilohertz. That's a typical value. Some vary. If our center frequency is 93.00 megahertz, then with a bandwidth of 20 kilohertz, then we 10 kilohertz either side of the center. So 93 minus 10 kilohertz is 92.09 megahertz, and high frequency of 93.01 megahertz. And you take, subtract FL from FH and you get your 20 kilohertz. Most or all communication signals we think of in practice have usually some center frequency and some bandwidth. Now, back to our slides. What frequencies do we transmit signals at? What are the typical uh, frequencies used for communication signals? Well, this plot shows the range of communication signals, the spectrum for telecommunications, ranging from 1 hertz, 100, we see a logarithmic scale, 100, 1,000, 10,000, 1 million, 1 gigahertz, 10 to the power of 9, up to 10 to the power of 15 hertz. This is the, the range of frequencies used for communication signals, the spectrum for telecommunications. So where does our FM radio channel fit in there? 93 megahertz is about 100 megahertz. 100 megahertz is about 10 to the power of 8, or is 10 to the power of 8 hertz. So here, 10 to the power of 8 hertz is the typical range of FM radio. And this plot shows us some examples of uh, some applications. FM radio and TV use similar frequencies. AM radio in the order of 1 megahertz, say 900 kilohertz. Satellite TV if you have a dish to receive satellite TV, what frequency does the satellite transmit at down to your receiving dish? In the order of several gigahertz. So 10 to the power of 9 is 1 gigahertz, 2, 3, and so on. So this is showing some example applications and what frequencies they use. Not the bandwidths, we'll come to that in a moment, but what center frequencies typical applications use. Wi-Fi. Anyone know what frequency it uses? My wireless LAN Wi-Fi on the laptop? Two point four not megahertz. Gigahertz. Two point four gigahertz. It is where? Gigahertz is ten to the power of nine, so somewhere around here. So when my laptop transmits a signal up to the access point, the center frequency is at around 2.4 gigahertz. And in fact, the bandwidth is, uh, from memory, around 20 megahertz in that case. So different systems use different frequencies to transmit their signals. 
not just wireless systems. So far the examples, Wi-Fi, FM radio, AM radio, satellite, are wireless systems. Also wired or guided media. And these three are the examples of guided media that we'll go through. Twisted pair, coaxial cable and optical fibre. Twisted pair is these LAN cables. We'll go through them in a bit more detail, but the LAN cables that you plug into your laptop, similar to the telephone lines, they use the technology called twisted pair. We'll explain that in a moment. Uh, but, and I'll pass this around. I passed it around in the, in the class yesterday to the CS students. I had three of these and I ended up with just one at the end of the lecture. So don't take it home with you. That's the last one I've got left. Have a, have a look at the wiring at the end in, inside. So it's a, it's a LAN cable just cut and we've pulled out some of the wires. Count them as it passes around. But when you see the wiring, it's just copper wires with some plastic coating on it, some insulation. We send, with twisted pair, we send an electrical signal across that copper wiring. What frequency do we use for that electrical signal? Well, with twisted pair, we send signals in the r this range of frequencies, from 1 hertz up to about 10 to the power of 8 hertz, or 100 megahertz. about zero up to 100 megahertz. So that's the range of frequencies of the signal that we send across the twisted pair cabling or the wiring, the copper wiring. What bandwidth, if we use all of those frequencies, what bandwidth do we have available with twisted pair? if we range from the low frequency of 0 or 1 up to a high frequency of 100 megahertz, what's the bandwidth? 100 megahertz. Okay, it's the high minus the low. So, which is the typical bandwidth used for twisted pair. When we send a signal, we can occupy 100 megahertz as the bandwidth. Coaxial cable is another type of cabling system. It doesn't use the copper wires twisted around each other. It uses in a different arrangement. It's used in uh, some cable TV systems. So if you have cable coming into your apartment building, into your home, then possibly, I'm not 100% sure, but possibly it's using coaxial cable. And it also uses electrical signals across a conductor. And the signals range from around 1000 hertz, 10 to the power of 3, up to about 1 gigahertz, 10 to the power of 9 hertz. to the power of 3 up to about 10 to the power of 9 hertz. Bandwidth. Calculate the bandwidth. Approximately. Anyone? You don't need a calculator? What do you get? 10 to the power of 9 minus 10 to the power of 3 <coughs> is about 
Don't say anything to do with a six. One billion, I'll, don't you write it down, but 10 to the power of nine, nine zeros, minus 1,000. This is very small compared to this. It's about one billion. It's 990 million, okay? Approximately, because this is very small, it gives us a, a bandwidth of about remove this now 10 to the power of 9 mega uh, 10 to the power of 9 Hertz 10 to the power of 9 if we write it in megahertz 1,000 megahertz okay a little bit less that's what this diagram shows us when we send our signals across coaxial cable the amount of bandwidth we have available is about 1,000 megahertz when we use twisted pair, it's about 100 megahertz. With all other conditions being equal, which one do you think gives us the highest data rate? Which one's faster? Twisted pair or coaxial cable? Have a guess. Which one do you think is faster? Twisted pair or coaxial cable? Look at the bandwidth. The second one, coaxial cable, why? I don't know why. Ha have Just a. Guess it. All right, uh, look, look at the numbers. The bandwidth is bigger, and a, as a general rule, with everything else being the same, the larger the bandwidth, the larger the data rate. Okay? If, we get, if we've got more bandwidth to use, we can send our bits faster. So, and it turns out to be true in most cases, if we use coaxial cable, we could send data at a higher rate than when using twisted pair, because the bandwidth is much higher. There are other reasons why we can get the impact upon data rate as well, like interference uh, and protection from inter interference. Both of those, twisted pair and coaxial cable, we send some electrical signal across some conducting material, copper for example. A third technology, optical fibre. <coughs> With optical fibre we have very thin strands of glass or plastic and with some insulation around them and we uh, pass light through them. Not electricity but we have a light source at one endpoint and the light reflects through the fiber and arrives at the other endpoint. So we send a signal which is light and we see that because the signals used in optical fiber the portion of the spectrum is the portion of or it's a set of frequencies which are about the same as the visible light. The same frequencies as the light coming from the, the ceilings from the projector and so on. So we just send light through optical fiber. Calculate the bandwidth available in optical fiber. Range is, so we send, when we send light, the range of frequencies we transmit are about 10 to the power of 14 up to 10 to the power of 15 hertz. gives us a bandwidth of what? Ten to the power of fifteen minus ten to the power of fourteen. Quite easily, nine by ten to the power of fourteen. Hertz. That's our bandwidth available when we use optical fiber. Which is how many megahertz?
with optical fiber, the bandwidth we have available is about 900 million megahertz. With twisted pair, it's 100 megahertz. So about 9 million times the amount of bandwidth available. And similar, uh, about a million times more bandwidth coaxial cable. Which one do you think is faster now of the three? Fiber optic cables. The much larger bandwidth available uh, in optical fiber. Now these are just approximations. They don't take these numbers to be exact and under different systems it varies. But it's a, a good indicator that with optical fiber we have a much larger bandwidth available. The bandwidth is the difference between the maximum frequency and the minimum. Now note that this diagram is on a logarithmic scale. So even though this line is the largest of the three, this one's very small, note the scale here means that this small one at this uh, end point is, represents a much, much larger bandwidth than the other two. So the scale can be confusing on this picture. What we're going to do is go through and talk just briefly about those three wired technologies. Co uh, twisted pair, coaxial cable and optical fibre. Before that, what else do we see on this picture? So it shows us some example technologies in these six and then some classification of technologies at different range of frequencies. So from about 10 to the power of 4 to 10 to the power of 9, generally called the radio frequencies. And then we have microwave frequencies. So sometimes you'll hear reference to a microwave system. It's referring to systems that support signals in these frequencies. Infrared, okay, your remote control, your infrared pointer. And then visible light, okay the frequencies of light that we see. And there are frequencies, of course, above that in the spectrum, but not used commonly for communication systems. So there's, and I cannot remember, X-ray, gamma-ray frequencies okay, are the classifications, but not, not important for most communication systems. This plot also shows on the bottom axis wavelengths. Remember, wavelength is inversely proportional to frequency. The relationship, the wavelength, lambda, is the speed of light, C, divided by the frequency. And it shows that if we have a, uh, a frequency of 100 megahertz, the wavelength here is about... Uh, a third of a meter, about 30 centimeters, if you do the calculation there. Uh, sorry, about three, three meters. So 10 to the power of zero is one, 10 to the power of one is 10, it's about three meters is the wavelength. So sometimes people talk about the wavelength of a signal, uh, other times more commonly frequency. Last thing to see on here, when people talk about different ranges of frequencies, sometimes they give names to refer to a particular range. Radio, microwave, infrared, and some other names uh, along the top here. LF, MF, HF. Anyone want to guess what those three mean? LM, LF, MF, HF. Lo low frequency, medium frequency, high frequency. Just some names that different organizations give to the different set of frequencies. Low frequency, medium frequencies, high frequencies, VHF. Very high frequencies. They're not very uh, ingenious names. They are uh, uh, 
UHF, ultra high frequencies. SHF, super. EHF, extremely high frequencies. Okay, so it's just getting uh, larger and larger. So what's next? You can make something up. What about the other direction? VLF. Very low frequencies. ELF. Extremely low frequencies. Here's a confusing one. VF. The only one that doesn't follow this pattern. VF is for voice frequencies. If we look at the frequencies, we're in the order of uh, several hundred hertz or 500 hertz up to 5 kilohertz, which is the range of the human voice. So VF, voice frequencies. You don't need to remember the, those definitions, or, and, but just understand when you hear someone talking about UHF, VHF, understand it's referring to a portion of the spectrum where the, indicating the frequencies of the signals used in that system. And you can look it up to find the exact frequency. Any questions on our, our spectrum? Remember, spectrum means the range of frequencies, a set of frequencies. Well, this is the spectrum for all communication signals, the entire set of frequencies used for any signal. Let's look at three examples of guided media. You would have heard of most of them. Twisted pair, coaxial cable, and optical fiber are the three examples. The first two are similar in that we take some electrical signal, we generate electricity at the source, some electrical signal flows through some conducting material, say some copper wiring. And what are the characteristics of those systems, both of the first two? Electrical cables. So we connect, transmit some signal across a conductor. Copper is a common one. Now, without going back to and understanding all the details of the physics, the, one of the things that occurs when we transmit electricity ac across a conductor is that that represents energy flowing across the the wire, some of that energy radiates out of the conductor. Okay, so you can think of the signal going through the copper wire, some of the energy disperses outside of the copper wire. And also if there are other sources of energy nearby, that copper wire can pick up the energy from those other sources. So we transmit energy out if we're the copper wire and other transmitters can transmit such that our wire receives that energy. What that means is that when we transmit across one wire, we can cause interference on other cables, on other wires. And other sources transmitting electricity can cause interference on our cable, on our wire. So we need to deal with that because with interference, that's effectively noise for our signal. I transmit my signal across my copper wire. If there's other transmissions received at the receiver, they are considered noise by the receiver. So the receiver receives my signal, plus it receives all these other signals from other sources, which makes it much harder for the receiver to work out what the information was that I sent to it. So the more interference, the more noise and the, effectively the lower data rate that we can transmit the information correctly, the more errors occur. So we want to avoid interference. It's bad for our communication <coughs> systems. It results in poor quality signals being received. So now how do we, how do we minimize interference? Different ways. Keep the length of the cable short. The shorter the cable, the less that cable will pick up from other sources, and if it, the less it will radiate to other sources as well. So the shorter the cable, the better. 
But we said at the start that one of our requirements, or one of the things that we want, is to have long cables. So there's a conflict here. We cannot always just use very short cables. Where's our example? If I attach an endpoint to this, okay, the two uh, adapters on both ends, is it very useful for connecting your computer to other devices at this length? Not very useful. You can, but you need to put your laptop very close to the other device. Okay? Normally, you, know, you want a couple of meters or so. Or if you connect from this PC down to the third floor, you see it goes from the PC and it goes up in, inside here. And it goes up to the ceiling and the cable goes, in fact, through the ceiling down some wall cavities down to the third floor and connects to a device there. So we need 30, 40, 50 meters for those cables. The longer the cable, the more interference. Okay. How do we avoid interference other ways? Make sure that there are no sources nearby that transmit uh, energy, that transmit other electrical signals. Okay. Keep them away from other sources. In practice, not always possible. Look at our LAN cable. It actually goes from the computer, though you cannot see, most of you cannot see, it goes past a, a power cable and an audio cable and the, the VGA monitor cable on the floor and goes into the wall here and one of these in here is a, actually there's a video cable in, in there and I think even a phone, a telephone cable. All of them transmit electrical signals and they're all very close to each other which means they can all cause interference amongst each other. So it's not always easy to keep our cables away from other cables, other sources. So in fact the best thing to do is to design the cables, the arrangement of the cables such that they minimize the amount of energy they radiate and minimize the amount of energy that they pick up from other sources. How do you do that? Use some form of shielding. Add some coating around the wiring to protect, protect from interference. And or organize the wires such that they don't radiate so much energy out. That second one is how we get twisted pair. This, this LAN cable is an example of using twisted pair cabling you see that there are four pairs of wires in here. You, if you look closely, there are eight wires. Inside the plastic coating, so we have some outer white plastic coating and inside the coloured coatings, inside them copper wire. Each pair of copper wires is twisted around its partner in, the, in this manner. The reason for doing that is if we do twist them like that, when we send electricity along the pairs, that they effectively cancel each other out, causing very little interference on other sources and picking up <coughs> very little from other sources. So this is a way of arranging our wiring so that we minimise the interference. One way is to twist them around each other. There are other ways as well. So this has been around for 100 years or so, this concept of twisted pair. Inside this LAN cable there are four, four twisted pairs. There's some colour coding. If you look close you would see that each pair has a different twist length. So some are wrapped tightly, some are, have a longer twist length. And again that's just to minimise the interference between different pairs. So. Two insulated copper wires arranged in a spiral pattern. Inside a LAN cable we have four sets of those pairs. Where are they used? Telephone networks. Your home telephone wiring uses twisted pair. LAN networks, LANs. So you use them every day uh, in com computer networks inside buildings, homes and so on. Um, some old, uh, in the past, uh, old telephone networks use them between across cities as well but now that's been replaced by other technologies. 
So twisted pair is one of the most common wired media around. It's cheap, it's relatively easy to use, easily available, and supports moderate data rates. There are different variations of twisted pair. Some have more shielding than others. So you'll see references to shielded twisted pair, STP, and unshielded twisted pair, UTP. What is this one an example of? Shielded or unshielded? This is an example of unshielded twisted pair. In fact, when we say shielding, this plastic coating is not the shielding. It's just some insulation. The shielding contains, and I don't have an example, but contains some metal <coughs> shielding inside. Uh, say, in the outer white insulation, there's some metal inside there to shield the inner wires from interference. Now, what that means in practice, well, what that means, the, the advantage of the shielding is less interference. Less interference means less errors, better quality signal, and ends up with we can send higher data rates. So using shielding allows us to send our data faster. Not using shielding, we get lower data rates. So unshielded twisted pair is generally slower or supports lower data rates than shielded twisted pair. The problem with shielding is with unshielded, you can bend them very easily. Okay? You can install them quite easily. You can run them anywhere. You can feed them through the cavities in the, in the ceiling, in the walls, because they bend quite easily. When they have shielding, they have metal inside, and they just don't bend easy. I don't have an example, but it's very hard to bend. So the shielding makes it very hard to use in practice. So if you want to feed it through a wall or around some corners, you have to really bend it to do that. It just makes it uh, not so convenient to install and to manage the shielded twisted pair. So in practice, you'll see unshielded twisted pair, pair much more com is much more common than shielded twisted pair, even though shielding gives us higher data rates. Within these, there's also different categories which refer to the quality of the, the copper wiring and the manufacture of the, the materials. You may have heard of category f Cat 5, category, category 6 cabling. We're not going, to going into any more details about these three examples. Just give a quick uh, uh, examples of where they're used, uh, what some of the advantages and disadvantages are. Coaxial cable, also we send electrical signals across some conducting material. It's just that the arrangement is different from the twisting. It's arranged in that we have two conductors. We have some inner conducting material, some insulation around that, and then some outer conducting material. And we send our signals across both of the conductors, and this pattern of one inside the other, again, minimizes interference. So it's a way to arrange our uh, electrical system to minimize interference from other sources and onto other sources. They're both on the same axis, the, the two uh, conductors. Provides much more shielding from interference than twisted pair. More shielding, less interference, higher data rates and uh, longer distances as well as some practical results. Compared to twisted pair, we can go faster and longer with coaxial cable. Generally a bit more expensive, a bit harder to deal with. Uh, and where is it used? Cable TV systems. So, uh, a, inside a neighborhood and coming into your home if you have cable TV, a coaxial cable is used. In some audio video cabling, connecting hi-fi components, coaxial cable can be used. 
in the past used in long distance communication, say between cities, but mainly that's been replaced by optical fibre now. Optical fibre, we have this uh, this fibre in the middle and we send light at one end point and you can think it just bounces off and the light is received at the other end point. So our signals are not electrical now but a light signal. We have much higher bandwidths available. The fibres are usually glass or plastic. Where is it used? Long distance communications across a city, between cities, between countries. In some special cases inside a LAN or in a, a telephone network, but not so common. Uh, maybe between, say, in a data center where there's a lot of servers connected together, we use fiber to connect them together because we need very high data rates. But in your home, no. What's the advantage compared to the other two? We lose l much less of the signal as we transmit it. The signal attenuates much less than in the two other systems, which means the signal can go much further before it's too weak to be received, i.e. we can transfer across much larger distances. Much higher bandwidth available, much higher data rates available. So a single fiber in practice is equivalent to hundreds of different hundreds of cables. So much more convenient just to use one fiber as opposed to hundreds of individual electrical cables. And as a result, if you can replace 100 cables, 100 cables with one very thin fiber, and in fact have multiple fibers in a very small space, it's easier to install and a lower cost for installation. And we don't have interference from other electrical sources. So much better in terms of distance and data rate compared to the other two. So to finish on those three, a quick comparison. Of the three common guided media, we have twisted pair, coaxial cable, both used electrical signals. The data rates vary, so different systems have different data rates, but on the order of one gigabit per second is typical. With our LAN cables, 100 megabits per second, one gigabit per second is common. The distances we're talking about uh, for twisted pair up to about two kilometers, coaxial cable up to about 10 kilometers. In fact, usually they're much shorter than that. So with twisted pair, usually only used over a distance of distances of about 100 metres. But we can go up to two kilometres. So if we wanted to connect our two campuses together across 12 kilometres, we need some form of repeaters or amplifiers if we use either of these technologies. They're generally cheap especially when you only need data rates in the order of 100 megabits per second, one gigabit per second. If we compare, if we look at twisted pair, there's unshielded and shielded twisted pair, and also coaxial cable it has similar properties to shielded twisted pair, it has more shielding. With unshielded twisted pair, because it bends, it's much easier to install. But without the shielding, there's more chance of interference. With coaxial cable and a shielded twisted pair, we protect against interference, but with that shielding, it's harder to bend and therefore harder to deal with the cabling. So some trade-offs. If we move up to optical fiber, we're talking about data rates of 10, 100 gigabits per second and beyond. Usually, individual fibers are combined together so that a single cable has many fibers in one. Talking about distances about 40 kilometers. So if we want to connect an optical fiber from 
Tokyo to LA, the west coast of the US, how do we do it? We want a connection between Asia and the US. We're not going to use satellite, too much delay. How do we connect optical fibre? Down in the ocean, the bottom of the ocean. So there's ships that uh, essentially lay optical fibre off the back of the ship and it goes down under the ocean, and it's just a sub, what's called a submarine cable, and there's many of them laid across the Pacific Ocean and, and, and most of the oceans around the world and use optical fibre, but every 30 or 40 kilometres they need an extra device that receives the signal and then transmits it again because the maximum distance we can cover is about 40 kilometres. So in that case it's better to go much further because you need fewer of these intermediate amplifiers or, or repeaters. With optical fibre, the equipment for the cabling and the equipment for installing is much more expensive. With unshielded twisted pair, this has been cut. What we can do is just grab another piece and wrap the, join the wires together and it will work again. Okay? You can do this in your home. Just uh, rip off some of the insulation and connect <coughs> another wire together. And so you can make these at home yourself. Easy, cheap. With optical fibre, if you cut the fibres, you need very specialised equipment to join those fibres again. So very expensive, tens of thousands of dollars to do that for optical fibre. Because the fibres are gla very thin glass or plastic fibres and you can't just cut them and then join them back together again. Okay? So very expensive. But if we want to transmit data at very high data rates, 10, 100 gigabits per second, rather than using many electrical cables, using just a single optical fibre becomes cheaper. Okay. Even though there's this high initial cost, uh, because we can support large distances and large data rates, it eventually becomes cheaper. Of course, it's hard to install. So, quick, very quick coverage of three common wired transmission media. Any questions? Again, very quick. What I want you to know is the general trade-offs of those three media. Which ones are typically faster? Which ones cover the most distance? What's the advantage of shielding versus no shielding. Okay. Uh, I don't ask you to remember all the technical details, just the general trade-offs between those three. The remaining slides here, or the next few slides, give some more technical details. We're not going to cover them. That's if you want to look up and see the exact range of frequencies, uh, the attenuation across different systems, delay and so on and some different physical characteristics of the, the signals. <coughs> what we have for the rest of this topic is about wireless. So that was uh, some examples about wired. Now unguided media, where we send a signal from a transmitter and the signal disperses. So we don't, it's not guided along some conductor or inside some fibre, it's unguided, so wireless transmission. What we want to do is introduce the general concepts of wireless transmission, applicable to all wireless systems, and then we'll go through a few examples of, say, satellite, mobile phone, Wi-Fi. All right, the first four are just some examples. I think you know of plenty of examples. TV transmission, satellite, satellite internet, satellite TV, uh, Wi-Fi, infrared inside your home and so on. So there are many examples you know of of wireless communications. Uh, 
a simple model of a wireless communication system, we take some, at the transmitter, we have, say, some device that wants to send data. How do we send it wirelessly, or how do we send a signal across the air? And what we normally do is we take some electrical signal and some other device called an antenna that converts that electrical signal into some radio signal. which propagates through the air and is received by another antenna which has the job of converting it back to an electrical signal. So, some of the things we care about, again, how fast can we send our data, data rate? How far can we send our data? So, what distance can we separate the transmitter and receiver by so that they can still communicate? And they will depend upon a number of factors, including the antennas. So the antennas have an imp a large role in how good our communication systems is. <coughs> so let's just introduce the concept of or what the antenna does and a few simple concepts, uh, which we'll finish for today. So our antenna takes some current and creates some electromagnetic wave that propagates through the air. And the receiving antenna takes that wave as an input, that energy, and converts it back to some current, back to electricity at the, the receiver. What type of frequencies are we transmitting wirelessly? Typically ranging from 3 kilohertz up to 300 gigahertz. We will, look at diff we will look at different characteristics of antennas and it turns out whether it's an a transmit or a receive antenna they have the same characteristics. I don't mean that the transmit and receiver must be the same type of antenna but when we look at the properties uh, we'll introduce things like the size of the antenna, the gain of the antenna, uh, those same properties apply for both transmit and receive. So sometimes we'll just discuss one of them. Now what does our antenna do? Some electricity comes in and it produces a wave that comes out. So it, it, disperses, it, it disperses energy, okay, the signal. Importantly, the direction in which that energy or that signal is dispersed uh, has an impact on how well we communicate. So the direction and how it propagates, how far it propagates, depends upon the shape of the antenna. So the design of an antenna has a large impact upon how far we can transmit and how we can arrange our antennas so that we can communicate. Before we go through these, give me an example of an antenna that you've seen or you've used or you know about. The shape or the size of an antenna. The Eiffel Tower, okay. What frequency does it transmit? It? I have no idea. Uh, other systems you may have used here in Thailand today, in the last hour, in the last two minutes. Does your mobile phone have an antenna? Yes, it does. You cannot see it, it's built into the, into the, the handset itself. Uh, I don't even know the shape of it, but uh, that they may be different on different phones. You may remember some old mobile phones, you had a pull-up antenna, okay, the old style ones. Now they're built in. Same as my laptop has an antenna built into the back of the screen here. Okay, so it's usually some pattern uh, on there. It's hard to visualize. Antennas on the wireless LAN access point, these two poles, two sticks here are the antennas, called dipole an antennas. What other ones have you seen recently? Maybe the red, true UBC satellite TV antennas, about what well, this big for satellite TV you have in your home, and uh, these parabolic dish antennas, so they're common shaped antennas. Uh, 
of course, this size antenna versus a small one on an access point, we will see that generally the larger the antenna, the further we can transmit a signal. And we'll look at those properties. The bigger the antenna, the better it is for sending a signal. Maybe you've seen on mobile phone towers, on the top of buildings or on some tower, if you look at the top of those towers, you'll see some rectangle type antennas or, or sort of pads that I uh, can help draw it like this. They're what's called sector antennas. They look like a rectangle. They effectively transmit in one sector of a, of a circle. So many different types of antennas. The antennas for your radio on, on your car, uh, old style TV antennas. So the shape the size of the antenna has a large impact upon how well it sends a signal. A, an ideal antenna, or a, a very simple antenna, is called an isotropic antenna. This is an antenna which, if, if this was an isotropic antenna, what it does is we receive some electrical signal and it produces a wave that comes out, the, the signal that we're transmitting. And the energy in that signal with an isotropic antenna disperses in all directions equally. What that means is that if we could see the energy coming out of this isotropic an antenna, in this direction, forward, back, left, right, up, down, in all directions around, the energy will disperse equally. So if we transmit with some power level from the source and we measure the power received, say, one meter in this direction, and we measure it to be one watt, okay? then if we measure it one meter behind, it will also be one watt. It will be the same in front as behind, and to the left, and to the side, and up and down, and all around. One meter away from the source, would all get this one watt as the receive signal, because the energy disperses equally in all directions. It's called an isotropic antenna. So you can think around the transmitter, we've got some spheric sphere that indicates how the energy disperses. It's an ideal antenna, and in practice, all of our real antennas are referenced against this ideal isotropic antenna. We cannot build one. We can get close, but uh, it's, um, the, the practical limitations mean we cannot build this perfect dispersion of energy. So there's an isotropic antenna, in theory. What about other types of antennas? Well, it depends upon how the energy disperses. With isotropic, it goes equally in all directions. In others, it goes strong in one direction, but weak in other directions. So some examples, common ones we'll see, an omnidirectional antenna. With an omnidirectional antenna, we say the energy across one plane, say the horizontal plane, is dispersed equally. So from here, going forward, going back, left and right, the energy disperses in the same manner, equally. But up and down, in the vertical plane, it's much weaker. Which means if I measure one meter in front of me, the received signal to be one watt, but I measure one meter above me, the signal strength will be less than one watt. It will be weaker, to say half a watt. It depends upon the design of the antenna. So an omnidirectional antenna goes equally in all directions on one plane, but say up and down on another plane, uh, much weaker. You can sometimes uh, um, we see a, a diagram that shows it as like a donut. So it's round in this area, but uh, doesn't go up or down. These dipole antennas on the access point are, are omnidirectional. They, around the, the pole, they essentially transmit equally in these directions, but down and up 
quite weak. Directional antenna uh, concentrate the power in one particular direction. So think of the parabolic dish antennas you see for satellite TV, a dish about this big. You need to point them at the satellite in space. Okay? For your TV, if the satellite is up there, if you point the dish that way, you will not receive the TV. Okay? So that's because that antenna concentrates all of the energy in one particular direction. So the energy and the resulting signal is very strong in that direction, but in other directions, behind and to the sides, it's very weak. So again, if we measure uh, the signal strength one meter away in this direction, if it's one watt, and in the opposite direction, maybe 0 0.001 watts, very well, strong in one direction, but weak in other directions. It's directional. And there, the different shapes of antennas and the different designs uh, impact upon how that energy is uh, focused or concentrated in a particular direction. So sometimes it's highly directional, sometimes it's dispersed across an area and, and in different patterns. Antenna gain. Can I give you a quick example instead of going through antenna gain? Uh, I'm talking about wireless connections, antennas, and my Wi-Fi doesn't work on the laptop. So that's, I wanted to show you some examples of some antennas, uh, but you've seen plenty. If you go to this website, Cisco is a company that manufactures networking equipment, including some wireless equipment. And from there you'll find some links in one of the pages, and I'll try and show it tomorrow, uh, gives some description about antenna concepts and gives many examples of antennas. You'll see pictures of these dipoles, sector antennas, some dish antennas and so on. Since my internet's not working and we need a bit more time to explain antenna gain, I'm going to stop there and we'll continue that start on talk about how do we compare the design of real antennas against an isotropic antenna? To know that, and this is what you need to study tonight if you can't remember, we're going to talk about decibels. So we saw decibels when we looked at uh, the Shannon capacity equation, signal to noise ratio. Remember decibels, 10 times log base 10 of one power level divided by another. So. We'll use that same concept when we talk about antennas. So just remember, and if you can't remember, remind yourself about the equation for decibels and the concepts behind it. Let's continue tomorrow morning.